My name is Glenn Howard. I'm president of the Jamestown Foundation, and, and we're very excited to have another terrorism conference here in December, uh, our 12th annual conference. Uh, we're very honored that we have here today uh, as our speakers. We will have uh, General Allen, the president of Brookings, former CENTCOM commander, will be speaking later in the afternoon, but all day with us will be uh, Sir John Scarlett, who is the former head of MI6, that and we're delighted that he is here along with his wife, uh, Lady Scarlett. So uh, please give them a round of an introduction and thank you for coming today, sir. <laughs> well, many of you know that terrorism often operates in cycles. And uh, uh, last year when we had our uh, 11th Annual Conference, we were honored to have uh, uh, General McMaster, former National Security Advisor of the President, was here speaking. Um, and we've had over the years a lot of events and conferences on terrorism. And last year, the, we really reached the kind of the apex of, of ISIS. And we've seen the fall of Raqqa and the downfall of ISIS, but the, they're not quite out of the game. Uh, so much of our, the world is still kind of uh, shifting and adjusting uh, to what has happened in uh, Syria uh, in the fall of Mosul. Uh, as many of you saw in the headlines, Iraq is now back uh, celebrating now a one-year anniversary of the fall of Mosul. So uh, I think things are changing in, in the world. We really don't know how to be. Next year you may be here and this room may be filled to capacity as there may be another terrorism event uh, occur. And as we, the events of yesterday in Strasbourg uh, indicate, uh, terrorism just won't go away. Uh, so we're uh, honored that in this event today we have with you, we have um, Bruce Hoffman, a uh, professor at Georgetown University, who's also the Shelby Cullum and, and Catherine Davis, visiting senior fellow for counterterrorism and homeland security at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's also a board member of Jamestown. We're very honored to also have here Bruce Riddell, who is director of the Intelligence Project at Brookings, a uh, new title for him. Uh, and Bruce, as many of you know, is a very prolific writer, has written many books. His most recent book is called uh, Kings and Presidents, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia since FDR. Um, and last but not least, we have Michael Ryan, who is a senior fellow at Jamestown uh, and is the author of the book Decoding Al-Qaeda's Strategy uh, and also the author of a recent Naval War College report called um, On the Study of ISIS, a terrorist group that would be a state. Um, Bruce Hoffman, I wanted to mention, has written has, uh, the third edition of, of his book, Inside Terrorism, and uh, uh, this book is, continues to be the standard guidebook for uh, terrorism studies in the United States, and uh, we're just very honored that we're able to draw upon these experts uh, to come and speak, and so I will now... Um, turn the floor over to Bruce. We'll have the discussions and followed by questions and answers. And so, uh, Bruce, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Um, it's always a pleasure to come speak at the Jamestown Foundation Conference. As Glenn alluded to, it's a, it's a, it's a little more challenging this year because, of course, 11 months ago, uh, the Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, uh, unveiled the U new U.S. national security strategy. And one of the key messages in the new strategy is that fighting terrorism would no longer be the preeminent concern, uh, preeminent national security concern of the United States, but rather great power competition with Russia and China in particular would now be its focus. And, you know, when Secretary Mattis said that, um, with all due respect, I thought of something that then General Mattis had said when he was in command of the Central Command a few years ago when, when he remarked or observed that the enemy also always gets a vote. And in that respect, even though terrorism may no longer be our preeminent concern, it certainly doesn't mean that the threat has receded or faded in any way, despite what's often proclaimed to be the defeat and even in some more hyperbolic rhetoric, the obliteration of ISIS. And the reason I say that is if you had the opportunity to review the new national strategy for countering terrorism that the National Security Council and the White House released uh, last September, which is, uh, I think, very, uh, very coherent and cohesive um, strategy, certainly a worthy successor to its four predecessors. 
what leapt out to me, at least uh, right on the first page in the executive summary, is where the point about the success against ISIS, and particularly the destruction of its caliphate, is made. But at the same time, the national strategy noted that ISIS still maintains eight, ofi eight official branches in some two dozen networks scattered across uh, North Africa, West Africa, the Middle East, uh, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. And according to a variety of estimates, um, I think it's safe to say that, that even now ISIS still has at least 25 to 30,000 fighters arrayed throughout those, um, those branches and networks, which may, may in fact be a conservative figure. Similarly, even though we don't hear much about Al-Qaeda, um, Al-Qaeda certainly hasn't gone away either. Um, a study I did at the Council on Foreign Relations last March um, came up with, I think, a lowball estimate of some 30 to 40,000 Al-Qaeda fighters arrayed around the world in some two dozen different uh, franchises or affiliates. And lest anyone take any solace from Al-Qaeda's recent quiescence, uh, that number of, of franchises, about three times the figure of, of, of a decade ago. So, so Al-Qaeda is clearly growing and ISIS is hanging on. I mean, what explains this? How is it that after being confronted with perhaps the greatest onslaught in history against two terrorist movements, both are nonetheless still able to survive? And I think there's um, four explanations. Uh, firstly, and I'll unpack each of them very briefly, um, ISIS anticipated its battlefield defeats and the loss of the caliphate and prepared accordingly, and I'll describe that in a second. Secondly, in, in my analysis, Al-Qaeda patiently plays a long game and is marshalling its resources very quietly behind the scenes to continue the struggle that, after all, uh, was declared by bin Laden now two decades ago, and lest anyone think Al-Qaeda isn't around uh, for the future, this past August, the movement celebrated its 30th anniversary. And you don't get to be 30 years old as a terrorist group unless you have an enormous capacity for adaptation and adjustment, even against some of the most formidable consequences and countermeasures imposed by your governmental enemies. Third, technology continues to abet and facilitate terrorism. And again, lest anyone think we've turned a decisive corner in the war on terrorism, I want to say a few words in a moment about the recent upsurge in targeting of commercial aviation, which is extremely alarming. And then finally, our own impatience, in the sense that despite a succession of extraordinarily impressive tactical successes, we have still yet, nearly two decades into the struggle, failed to produce any kind of decisive strategic victory. So let me briefly talk about ISIS. Um, here we know that over two years ago, ISIS's leader and founder, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, was already telling foreign fighters not to come to the then dwindling, shrinking caliphate, but rather to migrate to the variety of branches that the national security, the national strategy for countering terrorism has illuminated. And I think this has paid dividends. Lest anyone think that the international terrorist threat from ISIS is over, that it's just a matter of, of uh, self-radicalized, uh, lone wolf type of, of terrorism. Uh, we only have to think back to the horrific bombing of the Ariana Grande concert in Manchester in May 2016, which was perpetrated by an ISIS operative um, who traveled between the United Kingdom and Benghazi um, and who had connections with ISIS cells in Spain and in Belgium as well. Um, also, we, beneath the surface, ISIS has always played a long game. Uh, I made this point last year at the conference, so I don't want to belabor it, but we know that, in fact, two years before the simultaneous suicide attacks that rocked Paris in November 2015, ISIS had put in place an external operations network at a time when the conventional wisdom or the prevailing assumption was that, firstly, ISIS was an, ent an entirely local phenomena. I mean, this is one of the advantages of studying terrorism for a long time, especially if you have a decent memory. You can remember some of the past foibles or, uh, or assertions that have not proven to be correct. So one was that ISIS was an en enormously, was entirely a local phenomena that it was just interested in the caliphate and in uh, the Levant and Iraq, and that even if it did want to strike further afield, it didn't have that attack capability. And of course, the Paris attacks and the follow-on ones in, in, in Brussels and Istanbul um, laid, that, um, laid that bare. And of course, there are open source reports from the United States intelligence community that 
hundreds of ISIS fighters, certainly, uh, but many of ISIS's leaders were able to flee Syria, um, escape uh, the, the catastrophe that was being visited upon them in Raqqa and other places, uh, bribe their way through Syria, through Turkey, and thereby disappear. The entire foreign fighters issue has uh, become something of, of, of some contentiousness, especially because we haven't heard much from them, but they're nonetheless, I think, a malignant presence in many countries that bears uh, watching. Um, for my money, at least, the most accurate figures have been produced by my former colleague at RAND, uh, uh, Dr. Kim Cragen, who's now working at the National Defense University, who's actually traveled throughout the world speaking to officials in many countries, uh, including prisons, defense ministries, police, uh, intelligence and security service, to come up with her own figures. And she has concluded that, much like everybody else has, about 40,000 foreign fighters gravitated to the caliphate from at least 120 different countries. I mean, this in and of itself is an enormous uh, accomplishment that a terrorist group was able to attract that many people and from you know, roughly two-thirds of the world's countries. Only about 10,000 were killed. At least 15,000 fled Syria and Iraq. About 7,500 returned home or were deported to third countries. About, well, fewer than half or in prison or being actively monitored. Turkey very helpfully deported about 5,000 foreign fighters but neglected to tell the countries of which these individuals were citizens where they were being deposited and they've since disappeared. About 2,500 have migrated to the Sudan and may since have left the Sudan. About 2,700 have relocated to other conflict zones, particularly in North Africa and West Africa, in the Sahel, and about 8,000 or so remain in, in Syria. Even if the threat from foreign fighters doesn't materialize on this grand scale, an arrest that was made in Copenhagen last February to me depicts the immense challenges that intelligence and security services and law enforcement face in this new environment. And the reason I say that is an individual was arrested as, uh, as part of a raid on an ISIS safe house. This, in, this individual was born in Somalia, lived in the United Kingdom, carried a Finnish passport, went off to fight in Syria, and then returned to Denmark. That ISIS cell that he was involved in also was connected to the May 2016 Ariana Grande a concert bombing in, in Manchester. So that's ISIS. Let me very quickly talk about um, al-Qaeda. Since 2012, and Ayman al-Zawahiri's ascendance to leadership, he has worked assiduously and diligently to ensure that the new al-Qaeda is completely impervious to any single decapitation or knockout blow. He has deliberately scattered what we call AQSL, the al-Qaeda senior leadership, from the AFPAC region, where they were long, uh, pretty, pretty largely or mostly based, to countries as diverse as Syria, yes, Iran, Turkey, Libya, and Yemen. Uh, Al-Sahab, Al-Qaeda's perennially active media arm, often boasts that it is able through off-the-shelf, commercially uh, procurable communications encryption to ensure that Zawahiri remains in contact with his minions and leaders scattered across the world. So Al-Qaeda basically lays low while we remain preoccupied with and in some instances exhausted by ISIS and by the ongoing uh, war on terrorism. And Al-Qaeda, at least in my view, has taken uh, advantage of this interregnum and pursued a three-pronged strategy uh, to enable it to continue to marshal its resources to carry on the struggle that, after all, Bin Laden declared more than two decades ago. Firstly, stick to the highly effective decentralized franchise approach that has enabled Al-Qaeda to, to survive the onslaught of the war on terrorism. And to do this, perniciously, and what I find particularly uh, concerning, is that Al-Qaeda is pursuing a far more local agenda than it ever has in the past. I mean, Al-Qaeda now is actually interested in local governance. A decade ago, it was just a bunch of terrorists and thugs and left that to other groups. But pressed by ISIS, um, having witnessed the success that ISIS has had, Al-Qaeda is very much pursuing a local agenda and fusing that with its overall global um, jihadi um, strategy. So it has successfully thus far implemented what one might call a global strategy. Secondly, in 2013, al-Zawahiri uh, issued an edict 
that Al Qaeda fighters should avoid uh, mass casualty attacks, especially those that might harm uh, fellow Muslims. This proved enormously prescient and timely, of course, when ISIS began its campaign of serial depredations and barbarity. And this, consequently, as part of Al Qaeda's new local face, has enabled the organization to portray itself, and this is its own words, as quote unquote moderate extremists, uh, certainly in contrast uh, to the mercurial, unpredictable ISIS. And then thirdly, since 2015, almost all of the Al Qaeda affiliates or franchises have abided by a ban on attacks on Western targets that Al Zawahiri imposed so that Al Qaeda could continue both its rebuilding and its insidious infiltration into local conflicts. Um, technology, what are a couple of things on the horizon that make me very concerned that terrorism has not gone away? Well, we had a, we had a phenomenally successful decade from September 2004 um, until October 2015 where there were no successful terrorist attacks on commercial aviation. That changed at the end of October 2015, about two weeks before the Paris attacks, thanks to ISIS who perpetrated the first successful attack on a commercial um, airliner. It was a Russian charter plane that was en route from Sharm um, el-Sheikh with, with, with visiting tourists. That too defied the prevailing paradigm that we had made commercial aviation so hard of a target that terrorists had inevitably had to shift their focus to softer, more accessible targets, people walking on a beachfront promenade or walking down the West Way in New York City, and that terrorists wouldn't want to strike commercial aviation. But over the past three years, we've seen an increased focus on this target. Only a few months later, in February 2014, Al-Shabaab, which I would classify as about the C team of terrorists, probably the most, uh, certainly a, a bloodthirsty, sanguinary organization, but not the most technologically sophisticated uh, pencil in the pack, nonetheless was able to acquire technology from Al-Qaeda's branch on the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen and smuggle a bomb into a laptop onto a Dalo Airlines flight departing from Mogadishu. Now, the security of Mogadishu is, of course, I haven't been there myself, but I dare say it's not like Dulles Airport or Heathrow. Um, but the point is that even a technologically relatively inept group was able to acquire the wherewithal and was able to get the bomb on the plane. Now, bomb making in general is more art than science, I, I, I would argue. And the barometric um, triggering device was not calibrated ac accurately the, and the bomb blew up before the plane had reached cruising altitude, so the bomber was killed, a hole was made in the side of the plane, it was the pilot was still able to land it. But a few minutes more and that would have been a catastrophic failure. Um, there's the still unexplained May 2016 mid-flight crash of Egyptian Airways Flight 804 that was en route from Paris um, to Cairo. There was a March 2017 plot by ISIS to bomb a Turkish Airways plot. And then, lest anyone sleep easily, uh, and this is one of the problems in studying terrorism, we remember the spectaculars, and we often recall and focus on the successful terrorist attacks, but we generally forget about the failures or the ones that were aborted or the ones that the sophistication are, of our intelligence and security and, and police forces were able to interdict. But in July 2017, a senior ISIS commander operating from Turkey enlisted both of his brothers uh, living in Sydney and enmeshed them in a plot uh, to bomb an Itihad Airways flight and route from Sydney to Abu Dhabi. Now, this was a plot that uh, failed because they, for reasons that I haven't been able to determine, but some of you may know, they packed the bomb into a meat grinder, which seems like a good place to secret a bomb, except it was much too heavy and was not accepted by the check-in uh, counter uh, personnel um, as luggage, and the plot unraveled, everybody left, you know, another group of incompetent terrorists. Well, they had a follow-on plot, and the follow-on plot was to recreate the Mubtakar, this was a chemical dispersal device that Al-Qaeda had planned to use in an attack on the New York City subway in early 2003 that for reasons we still don't know, Al-Zawahiri canceled. But to use a chemical device uh, made with hydrogen sulfide and to put that um, on the plane as, as well. So let me conclude uh, with two points. The first one is that these days, I think somewhat sh short-sightedly, the metric that we're applying to success in the war on terrorism uh, is, the, is a very simple one. It's that neither Al-Qaeda or ISIS in recent years have been able to pull off a spectacular. The terrorist attacks that we've seen are from self-radicalized individuals, lone wolves, but that the organizational uh, 
power of both groups has been diminished. Uh, as Bruce Rydell will also attest to, has, has looked at this issue a long time as well, and, and Michael Ryan, I mean, we've heard these things before, when terrorist organizations don't matter, the threat has is, is, is migrated down to lone wolves and to individuals, and we've also seen how that is not being the case. Terrorist organizations exist to engage in, in, in terrorism. And I go back to the point, you don't, you, you don't stay in business for 30 years like Al-Qaeda uh, to lay down your arms and quietly leave the playing field. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, I just want to, especially because it's, it's close to Christmas time, I want to leave you with a vignette from Christmas uh, 1939. Um, as you may recall, uh, earlier uh, that, that autumn in 1939, on September 1st, Germany invaded Poland, and two days later, Britain and France declared war on uh, Germany. Uh, thereafter, the so-called phony war uh, was in force where there was no further battles or movements of any sort of consequence. And around Christmas time, 1939, the British Third Infantry Division was part of the British Expeditionary Force arrayed across the Franco-Belgian border uh, to protect France from an invasion uh, from Germany. <laughs> and the then Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain paid a morale building or morale boosting visit to the troops and came upon the 3rd Infantry, which was then commanded by a Lieutenant General named Bernard Law Montgomery, who would subsequently go on to achieve fame as uh, Lord Montgomery of Alamein in 1942. And Prime Minister Chamberlain said to Montgomery, and this is a direct quote, I don't think the Germans have any intention of attacking us. Do you? Montgomery looked at him incredulously and said they will attack when it suits them and only when it suits them. And I would argue that is exactly the same mentality that our enemies in Al-Qaeda and ISIS still possess today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Glenn, and thank all of you for coming and thanks for inviting me back to this very important conference. Um, at Glenn's request, I'm gonna do something somewhat different, uh, get away from talking about terrorism per se and talk about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and particularly the American relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You'll see as we close, as I close, how this circles back, however, uh, to the question of terrorism. Now, the American relationship with Saudi Arabia turned 75 this year. It began in 1943, when then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt invited the King of Saudi Arabia, Abdulaziz Al Saud, to send a delegation to Washington to compare notes and to put the two countries on the same path in fighting the Axis powers and in thinking about the post-World War II era. The king sent two of his sons, Prince Faisal and Prince Khalid, uh, both of whom would go on to become kings in their own right. Uh, they came and stayed at Blair House in uh, Washington. Uh, they were not wined, but they were dined uh, by Congress, by the media, by the president. Uh, they then were sent on a long excursion across the United States to Texas, to California, to Washington State, and then back through Chicago and up into the Northeast all for a simple purpose. FDR wanted to impress on these two Saudis that America was the strongest, most powerful nation in the world. And it worked. And as a consequence, Saudi Arabia and the United States struck a bargain, a very simple bargain. The United States would provide security guarantees for the survival of the House of Saud from enemies both domestic and external. And in return, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia would assure a stable supply of oil to the world economy at reasonable prices. That simple bargain has been intact in this relationship ever since then. Note that it's a bargain entirely defined by common interests. There are no common values here. There's no attempt in the initial FDR Ibn Saud bargain to say that we share, in, share values about freedom of expression, freedom of religion, no, this was purely a bargain on basis of common interests. In the 75 years since then, the relationship has had many ups and many downs. One of the most famous ups, of course, came in 1990-91, Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, uh, and, the bar and the relationship between George H.W. Bush and King Fahd. It is very ironic that at uh, President Bush's funeral uh, just a week ago, no senior Saudi official 
was able to come because Saudi Arabia is today too toxic in the United States to come to such an event. There have also been lows, numerous lows. The 1973 war and oil embargo was probably the lowest of the lows, but we saw another one in 1978, in 2001, and 2011. In my book that Glenn mentioned earlier, I refer to these as near-death experiences. In each of these cases, the relationship seemed to teeter on the brink of collapsing completely. But it survived all of them. Today, it faces another near-death experience a near-death experience that was caused or pr uh, precedented by the premeditated murder of Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul on October 2nd. Uh, Mr. Khashoggi, as you all know, was a Saudi journalist working for the Washington Post. He was one of the most highly visible critics of the Saudi system. He was not a dissident. He proclaimed his loyalty to the monarchy. What he asked the Saudi system to do was to live up to its promises to reform itself and to open up its system. For that, he was tortured, murdered, and then dismembered by an assassin's team that had flown into uh, Istanbul specifically the, for the purpose of killing him. Uh, there is, of course, a dispute. I wouldn't say there's really a dispute. Uh, there is uh, argument over who ordered the killing. Uh, the Saudi government claims this was a rogue operation. Uh, anyone who's ever dealt with Saudi intelligence in any serious will regard that as ridiculous. Uh, according to newspaper accounts, the Central Intelligence Agency has concluded that the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was directly involved not only in ordering the assassination, but in actually monitoring it in real time. Jamal Khashoggi's death has precipitated this crisis, uh, and it is one that is well underway today. Uh, we have a good chance that we're going to have a vote in the Senate today uh, condemning Saudi Arabia uh, and invoking the War Powers Act to cut off American support to Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen. But while Khashoggi's death is the precipitating factor, I think it's safe to say that this crisis has been percolating for at least a year, if not longer. And it's been percolating in large part because of two personalities um, who have dominated the relationship. On the Saudi side, of course, the personality is Mohammed bin Salman, uh, 33 years old. Uh, four years ago, he was completely unknown, uh, unknown even in Saudi Arabia, but certainly unknown in the rest of the world. But today, he is very well known. Um, his four years' ascent to power has been a remarkable testament to how an absolute monarchy works. If your daddy is king, you can do anything you want to do, and ultimately he will make you the crown prince. Two crown princes have been dismissed from the line of succession with no explanation ever given. Uh, that's unprecedented in Saudi history. In the, uh, more than 100 years since the founding of the new kingdom and more than 250 years since the founding of the original kingdom, we've never seen anything like it. It is not a sign of stability when you change the line of succession twice in three years. His policy role has been, I think, safe to say, reckless, impulsive, and dangerous. Um, the most prime example of that is, of course, the war in Yemen. The war in Yemen was supposed to be Operation Decisive Storm, Harkening back to the 1990s, it proved to be anything but decisive. Saudi Arabia is now bogged down in a quagmire in Yemen that um, makes me, reminds me very much of the Vietnam War. Uh, but it is a quagmire that is enormously expensive, above all to the Yemeni uh, people. Uh, the war in Yemen is today the worst humanitarian catastrophe of our lifetimes, and it is poised on the brink of getting far worse. Four million Yemeni children stand at the brink of starvation. We know at least 85,000 have already starved to death, and that's a conservative figure. It is also a very expensive war for Saudi Arabia. The war in yeah, Yemen costs the Saudi Kingdom roughly $5 billion a month. Uh, that's an awful lot of money for a country that is seeking to reform itself. Saudi Arabia has the third largest defense budget in the world. Not all of that is because of Yemen, but it is an indication of just how expensive this is. Its rival in Yemen, of course, the Iranians, who support the Houthis, don't spend $5 billion a month in Yemen. 
I suspect they haven't spent $5 billion in Yemen since the start of their support for the Houthis. I'd be surprised if they've spent even $1 billion. In cost benefits terms, this is a complete black and white situation. The Saudis are spending a fortune. The Iranians are spending a pittance. The Saudis have also totally lost the propaganda war, the public relations war. Saudis and their supporters are seen as the, um, the ones creating the catastrophe. The Houthis have gotten a free pass, a free pass they most assuredly do not deserve. The Houthis are little more than a group of thugs, but you don't see much reporting about their atrocities. Yemen being the worst case, there are others. I won't go into the details about them, but the uh, blockade of Gutter, which is to all intents and purposes destroyed the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, the spat with Canada, which cost hundreds of Saudi uh, students in Canada their educations. Um, these are examples of a rather reckless system. At home, the Crown Prince has presided over unprecedented repression of Saudi Arabia's own citizens. Uh, Saudi Arabia has never been a paragon of human rights. It is, after all, an absolute monarchy married to a theocracy. But in the past, Saudi Arabia allowed a fair degree of commentary, not dissent, but commentary. And Saudi kings usually sought to rule by consensus building, reaching out to key constituencies, key parts of the royal family, the Wahhabi clerical establishment, the business establishment, and building a consensus. That has broken down under Mohammed bin Salman. That became obvious a little more than a year ago at the Ritz-Carlton when 400 or so of Saudi Arabia's most notable personalities were detained without charge and then literally shaken down for money. We don't know how much money MBS got out of the Ritz-Carlton, but it was a considerable amount. Uh, no charges were filed. Uh, there was no due process. Um, we know that some of the people involved were tortured. We know that at least two people were killed in the process of being tortured in the Ritz-Carlton. It's the most glaring example of how he has ruled at home, but there are other examples as well. Uh, female activists who advocated for the right to drive the very reform that, for which MBS is most uh, popularly credited are now languaging in jail some of them having been tortured. Uh, the details are which are pretty grim and I'm not going to go into today. The result is that the Crown Prince today does have an atmosphere of fear and intimidation around him and the murder of Jamal Khashoggi undoubtedly added to it, but that he has also produced many, many enemies in the kingdom. The old system attracted consensus and attracted loyalty. The new system is undoubtedly attracting conspiracy and plots. On the U.S. side, every American president since FDR has courted Saudi Arabia. No American president has courted Saudi Arabia as crudely and as avidly as Donald Trump. He, after all, made Saudi Arabia the first foreign country that he visited. Um, no American president has ever done that. Uh, he went, uh, and if ask you to think back a year and a half uh, to some of those pictures of sword dancing and the weird little globe that they were standing around, um, some really bizarre scenes. Uh, the rhetoric was as bizarre as well. We were told that there was $110 billion in arms deals. Uh, by my count, uh, currently under the Trump administration, perhaps $3 billion in arms sales have been concluded, uh, nowhere near $110 billion. Uh, Trump lauded the relationship because of its transactional nature. Uh, he said the fact that we don't share values in common was a positive thing. Now, if you look at Trump's relationship with other countries, uh, France, Germany, and the others, it's, it's all part of a pattern of an extremely unusual American president's foreign policy. It's a, essentially a blank check to Mohammed bin Salman. And in the last several weeks, we've seen that the president has ignored uh, the findings of the Central Intelligence Agency and chosen to go with his own view, which is it really doesn't matter whether MBS knew about the murder of Jamal Khashoggi or not. Of course, presidents do not stand for all of America and the United States Congress, the United States media, and I think it's safe to say the United States public in general 
uh, has been outraged by the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. It's no accident that he's on the cover of Time magazine this week, and it's no accident, as I said earlier, that the Senate is likely to take a vote uh, in the next few hours um, on the War Powers Act. It has already taken a vote on a preliminary version of the bill, which passed 63 to 37. Every Democrat in the Senate voted for it, and 14 Republicans defected. We may not get a vote quite as interesting as that today, but we're likely to get one uh, that certainly is an unprecedented rebuke of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. No Saudi arms sales has ever been disapproved in the history of the relationship between two, two countries. Some have gotten very tight. Whenever they got tight in the past, every administration, Republican or Democrat, always came up with the same solution. We'll give Israel $10 billion in aid as a compensation, and that almost always swings the vote just carefully enough to get the Saudis. Uh, that's not likely to be a pattern that works here in this case. It's not going to go away. The Saudis and President Trump may think it's going to go away, but believe me, um, press interest in this story remains quite active. I never believed how many people work at the Washington Post until this story happened, came along. Every single one of them seems to have my phone number. This crisis, in many ways, is different and in some ways much harder to resolve than the near-death crises that I've talked about before. And the reason is it's so much about personality. If the crisis was solely about policy issues, you could probably find some room for compromise. And the good news out of this crisis may be that a policy issue is heading towards a good outcome, and that's the war in Yemen. I don't want to say it has reached that, but there are encouraging signs coming out of the talks in Sweden. But the personality issue isn't going to go away. For much of the world, Mohammed bin Salman today is a toxic quantity, as is his younger brother, Khalid bin Salman, the ambassador of the United States. It's unlikely that MBS is going to be able to travel in a major Western country in the near future without mass protest and demonstrations against him. It is entirely possible that the Congress in January will pass legislation sanctioning Mohammed bin Salman. That's an extraordinary situation when the United States of America has sanctioned the crown prince of one of our oldest allies. It may not have a direct practical effect, but the symbolic effect is enormous. And then on the other side of the issue, there's the personality of Donald Trump. Donald Trump, for many, has become as toxic uh, as Mohammed bin Salman. It also means that the issue is increasingly seen in partisan terms here. I mentioned the vote in the Senate. Uh, it's overwhelmingly a Democratic vote in favor and a split Republican decision. The question of Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman is tailor-made for Democrats to run on as a political issue in 2020. Saudi Arabia has never been popular in the United States. Uh, you've never had enthusiasm for the United States supporting Saudi Arabia. It's ripe to be used as a partisan issue and is almost certainly likely to be very effective in that case. Painting the president as the defender of premeditated murder uh, is the kind of political issue that I'm sure many Democrats angling for the president are dying to do. In the worst case, worst case, the relationship could collapse. Uh, I don't think that's likely. I think the record of the last 75 years is that this relationship has enduring strengths to it and it probably will continue to endure. Uh, there are many institutional links below the level of president and king that help to make it go on. There are good common interests that continue to be needed for this relationship to go on. But it could, in fact, collapse. And the reason I say that is goes back to personality. Uh, people who are censured, uh, people who are attacked politically, uh, tend to react in unpredictable ways. And in the shape of Mohammed bin Salman, we have someone who we know reacts in reckless and unpredictable ways. We could see some very bitter recriminations coming out of all of this, uh, making it very hard for the relationship to last. I want to say one more thing, though, about if the relationship collapses. Uh, 
If the relationship collapses, it's a problem for the United States of America. It's a disaster for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We don't need Saudi oil anymore. The world global market needs Saudi oil, but the United States doesn't need Saudi oil. We hardly get any Saudi oil at all. Saudi Arabia needs the American security guarantee. It lives in a very, very dangerous part of the world. It has many, many enemies, and they are quite ruthless and determined enemies. All of this above adds to the degree of regional instability throughout the Middle East. All this confusion, all this um, uh, recklessness uh, has added to the already very dangerous currents in the region. Uh, one evidence of this is we've seen a marked degradation in the quality of the Saudi security services as MBS has purged supporters of his predecessor, former Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, out of the Ministry of Interior and other intelligence services. Uh, the trade craft exhibited by Saudi services in Istanbul, I predict, will become a um, role model in virtually every intelligence services um, beginner's class in how not to carry out a covert operation. Uh, I understand the CIA is already looking into setting up such a class at the farm. The Iranians, of course, are enjoying all of this. Uh, there's nothing that makes Iranians happier than to watch Saudis fumbling around uh, and their media is having a field day. But it's not just that they're having a field day. The focus of who is a terrorist in the region has taken off the Iranians, ironically at a time when Iran and Hezbollah have been caught cold-handedly in two attempted assassination attempts in Europe and focused on Mohammed bin Salman. The kingdom itself, which for at least the last 50 years uh, was extremely stable with a line of succession that was well understood, that was uh, very predictable. You not only knew who the next king was going to be, you could predict three or four kings out in the future, all sons of Ibn Saud. That is now very different. It was always going to be different as soon as the sons of Ibn Saud started to run out. Uh, that wasn't a problem for a long time since they had so many sons of Ibn Saud. But King Salman has accelerated the process and is now forcing the generational change much quicker than it had to be. Um, the next change in succession in Saudi Arabia, whether the king dies or the crown prince is removed, is very unpredictable. Um, there are no guarantees. We are now in uncharted waters about the future of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I can tell you, every other leader on the Western, pro-Western camp in the Middle East is very worried and alarmed by what this might mean. One final note. Um, the events of October 2nd uh, in Istanbul were a terrorist attack. Uh, Mr. Khashoggi was lured into a Saudi diplomatic facility where he was murdered. Uh, that amounts to an act of terrorism. He was an innocent civilian. If that is the only act of terrorism carried about by Saudi Arabia, it may prove to be a one-off. On the other hand, if it turns out that it's not a one-off, and there may already be other cases, then it will trigger something automatically, which is that the State Department has to take a review of whether or not Saudi Arabia is a state sponsor of terrorism. The State Sponsor of Terrorism Act is, is quite interesting. You're given one. You're one you, get, you can carry out one act of terrorism, it doesn't count. It's got to be more than one act of terrorism. It's never been said how many more, but one alone doesn't trigger this mechanism. But more than one would trigger it. Now, the United States State Department and United States presidents have a long history of determining that countries who should be on the state-sponsored list of terrorism are not on the state-sponsored list of terrorism, and of course, Pakistan stands at the top of that list. Um, but it does require a certain amount of review. This, of course, also raises what could be a truly draconian situation. If Saudi Arabia was found to be a state sponsor of terrorism, then the relationship would not only collapse, it would hemorrhage, it would be falling apart. Let us hope that cooler heads will prevail. The House of Saud have a proven track record of survival. 
The Saudi kingdom that we know today dates from 1902, but the original Saudi kingdom deals from 1744. The House of Saud has survived all these years because it doesn't stick with losers when it realizes it has a problem and is prepared to make adjustments and changes in personnel. We will see if that happens in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, thank you for that wonderful uh, discussion and analysis. Uh, the regional aspect is very important uh, in what Saudi Arabia is doing and, uh, and affecting the United States in the Middle East. Uh, our next speaker will be Michael Ryan, who will discuss the future of Al Qaeda and ISIS, the jihadist gray zone. He's a senior fellow at Jamestown. Michael? Thank you. Um, I always joke that I never, um, and it's not a joke, uh, I, I never disagree with Bruce Hoffman, that way I can always be right. So uh, I'm, what I'm looking at today is, uh, I, I started to take a look at how would the, uh, we see terrorists, specifically Al-Qaeda or ISIS, or those following their model, act in a gray zone context. Um, I, think, I think Bruce partly already described that as a, a long-term, without being named that long-term prospect of Zawahiri. So I'm going to talk about the gray zone, and for those of you who, who, who are, are unfamiliar with it, there's probably nobody, but um, uh, it refers to the space occupied by ambiguous military operations between war and peace or other activities in a space between the clearly legal and the illicit. Uh, for jihadists, such operations in the, in the coming period may uh, likely even uh, include weaponized dawah, preaching, proselytizing, and recruiting. Uh, lone wolf and small group terrorism using what David Gartenstein Ross has, has called the virtual plotter model, making weapons out of mundane objects, cars, trucks, knives that, that we've seen. But then the third one, I think, is, is more interesting, regional rebranding, retooling, and strategic regrouping. Uh, to be successful, these three elements of the jihadist revival will depend on Americans to conclude that the United States has done enough militarily against ISIS and Al-Qaeda, except for some final mop-up operations in Syria, normal diligence, and selective killer capture operations. Many Americans, I, I think, would accept such a conclusion and would also assert the need to find a reasonable end to the nearly two decades of frustrating war in Afghanistan. Recent jihadist losses might also prompt some to question the need for continued American uh, uh, focus on jihadism at all. However, the need for open source analysis and continued uh, military involvement um, at a certain level um, is, is, I think, crucial. Uh, and, it may, and the need for open source uh, analysis may be even greater if jihadist groups following either the ISIS or Al-Qaeda model enter this ambiguous gray zone between war and peace with the United States and plan for a spectacular comeback at some point. Three occasions, two involving the U.S. response to jihadism in light of our new national security strategy, and one involving recent jihadist uh, proclamations, shaped my analysis of the risks in the, in the coming period and the crucial need for continuing support for the type of analysis that you're going to hear today in abundance. The first occasion was a conference in June under uh, Chatham House rules uh, where one high-level administration speaker predicted that the number of special forces in Africa would be reduced significantly, maybe as much as 50 percent. Um, and, uh, and this was in the context of our new national security strategy, increasing focus on Russia and China. Reflecting these priorities, uh, Reuters recently confirmed this, that indeed the, uh, the United States is going to, to withdraw 10 percent of its total forces from Africa, which amounts to hundreds of troops, but it will shift from tactical assistance, which likely involves special forces, to advising, liaising, and sharing intelligence. This move is not expected to affect Somalia, Djibouti, or Libya. But in light of the new policy emphasis, more than a few analysts were concerned not about the needed policy emphasis on Russia and China, but instead that counterterrorism with the a possible exception of Iran would cease being a national security priority for DOD at all. Uh, the second event that influenced me to look at 
how gray, gray uh, zone operations would work, uh, was the reemergence at the end of August of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi with an hour-long sermon to rally his scattered and potentially lonely, and to use his term, uh, lonely supporters, and call on all Muslims to unite against secularists, atheists, and apostates, all in support of what he called the caliphal state, state, which still exists, although not physically in Syria. Al-Baghdadi was specific when he called on his jihadist fighters, starting with Iraq and Syria, which still is major focus, to call on the armies of the caliphate in, and I'm just gonna read them all, Khorasan, Yemen, East Asia, West Africa, Central Africa, Somalia, Libya, Sinai, Najd and Hejaz, Tunisia, Algeria, the Caucasus, and Kashmir. But for me, in this, this regard, was the most, the most interesting call out was his congratulations to the fierce lions in the land of the cross, Canada, then Europe, and then elsewhere. Significantly, he never significantly threatened the United States despite blood-curdling uh, accounts of what should be done to people in, in, in the coming jihad, but he never specifically threatened the United States, either in his calls to action or his congratulations to others who had, who had acted properly. The previous day, Ayman Zawahiri had made a similar speech on Al-Qaeda telegram channel, also calling for the unity of all Muslims against what he called the global alliance of disbelief against Muslims, um, uh, but again, he never really threatened the United States, as though he's done it uh, for, for many times. But he called on, on, uh, on Muslims uh, to unite against the Crusader states from Turkestan to the shores of the Atlantic. And Eve said it was 50 separate entities. Likely, uh, like al-Baghdadi, uh, he, he never threatened the United States by name, even though tomorrow he may do it. Instead, he used oblique references to, to Muslim resistance to this global alliance of disbelief. When Al-Qaeda began its, its, its operations, it was a clear war. They declared war, uh, and they've followed that uh, ever since, even with the, with the, the, the lower tempest of, of mass casualty attacks that, that, that Bruce uh, denied, uh, uh, Bruce uh, uh, laid out. Um, basically, uh, it was a three-zone three uh, Maoist guerrilla strategy, which they followed, uh, which the first was preparation, the second, uh, the second was, was just guerrilla operations, and the third was the conventional operations. Uh, in, in, in this way, both Al-Qaeda and, and uh, ISIS went to the conventional, the third rung. Their, their losses in, in, uh, in, in the Levant have caused them to move back down the ladder, not get off the ladder, to guerrilla, guerrilla warfare and, and, uh, and uh, preparation. Um, so, Zawahiri and al-Baghdadi seem to be, in these speeches, and, and, and they're important because they're carefully crafted, to be taking belligerent positions below the threshold that would attract further American military operations against either group, a position tantamount to the amb ambiguous gray zone, although they would never call it that. The final uh, thought-provoking event for me occurred on October 4th when the President signed a new uh, counterterrorism strategy. This new strategy noted that the terrorist threat to the United States is growing more dynamic and diffuse as increasing numbers of groups, networks, and individuals exploit global trends, including the emergence of more secure modes of communication, the expansion of social and mass media, and persistence instabil and persistent instability across uh, several regions. That's an, an end quote. Uh, the new strategy clearly asserts that counterterrorism remains a national, a national security priority and that violent jihadism remains a major challenge. In continuity with previous counterterrorism strategy, the new document reaffirms, and I quote, ISIS remains the foremost radical Islamic terrorist groups and the primary transnational terrorist threat to the United States, despite ongoing United States and coalition civilian and military efforts to have diminished the group's footprint in Iraq and Syria and killed thousands of its members and curtailed its global expansion. That's the end quote there. <clears throat> 
Uh, this new strategy al also introduced a renewed emphasis on security inside the United States, and it didn't mention the gray zone. However, an NSC discussion of the new policy with open source analysts, in including uh, uh, Jamestown, uh, did raise the issue of gray zone operations, as indeed did the conference that I mentioned before in which uh, especially the use of chemical and new, easily available biological agents were, were mentioned. Many countries operate in the gray zone as an adjunct to their conventional military forces. China, with a methodical extension of its territorial reach in the South China Sea, can be seen as the, the subtle but aggressive working of great power military operations below a threshold, war, a threshold of war with the United States. For example, China uses fishermen, the little blue men, as gray zone guerrillas. At the same time, China deters regional powers with its formidable conventional forces. Russia's aggressive use of gray zone private militia against American forces and their local coalition in Syria took a, a, a devastating response, which was carefully calibrated and contained as Russia denied all responsibility. Russia has, of course, used gray zone operations, the little green men, as part of what is often referred to as its hybrid war against the Ukraine. Non-state actors such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS are at present less understood threat in the ambiguous threat scenarios. Both Al-Qaeda and ISIS regularly publish a variety of battlefield reports and propaganda messages. Both organizations have significant strengths, and we should expect either or both to offer rhetorical and real threats against the United States or its interests abroad. I refer to the ISIS model and the, uh, 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 the ISIS model and the Al Qaeda model, because a wider jihadist movement since the Arab Spring contains local groups that follow a jihadi Salafi uh, ideology, but don't always declare allegiance to either organization. Even those groups explicitly affiliated to ISIS or Al Qaeda often operate somewhat independently and are focused on local priorities and targets. Gray zone operations have not generally been recognized as part of the jihadi Salafist terrorist campaigns or insurrections, as I mentioned before. But bin Laden began with a handful of men. After his death, al-Qaeda had tens of thousands of men and women devoted to his cause spread across the world. Similarly, before ISIS, Zarqawi began with a few hundred men and quickly advanced to tens of thousands of men's un under, men under arm uh, and control over a proto-state. Today, after the defeat in the Levantine Wars, both networks still have these tens of thousands of men. And what will the next war in, uh, what will the next 10 years or five years be in? Will we start counting them in the hundreds of thousands, but this time spread across a wider variety of places, often operating as though they're local and below an, an area that is usually a national security uh, threat to the United States we should expect a full panoply of operations and preparations aimed below the threshold of war with the United States, returning to the three main tactics I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, that is the weaponized Dawa uh, and, and uh, a lone, lone wolf, but then the regrouping and spread, uh, and with Bruce uh, mentioning of the spread also of leaders that we should expect significant organizations. Uh, First, I expect the proliferation of toxic jihadi Salafist preachers to continue, especially in countries that allow freedom of speech. These preachers will encourage jihadist operations while staying, staying within the parameters of local legality. The spread of their ideology will continue to ensnare vulnerable individuals who can also be targeted remotely uh, for further radicalization and even operational directions from remote safe havens via end-to-end -end encrypted uh, contacts. Radical individuals are a major focus of American enforcement agencies today, but are a greater challenge for our traditional allies in Europe and Canada. One great concern is the greater ability of exotic lethal weapons, such as chemical and biological agents, coupled with the expansion of secure internet communications, especially in Africa, uh, where we're reducing uh, our, our forces at, as we speak. Second, in the greater Middle East and beyond, I would expect continuing proliferation, regrouping, and alternative branding of jihadist groups that would operate on a war footing locally, but again, below the threshold of war uh, with the United States. They certainly will be war in a local context, but simply may not, we may not pay the proper attention to them. 
One can already see the blending of local or ethnic nationalism in North Africa with the global jihadist ideology of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, driven by their embrace of the concept of the jihadi caliphate that I think will outlive Zawahiri and al-Baghdadi. Left unchecked, some of these groups will be successful and could become to be real threats in their own rights to the United States at home and against our businesses and citizens abroad. A crisis in Canada, especially, or Europe, would eventually have serious impacts in the United States as well, which could be more difficult than the recent crises we have all witnessed. Meanwhile, I should expect ISIS and Al-Qaeda to continue to rebuild. In my opinion, we need more special forces and associated air power focused on this issue rather than the ineffective and expensive use of large conventional forces. We also need continued and even expanded open source analysis, which as you will experience today, uh, to track and interpret the migration of jihadist ideas and weapons research, even perhaps more than jihadist fighters, into new spaces. Nadia Shadlow's warning captures the essence of the problem which I am applying to jihadist movement and its global, global ideology. I'll quote Nadia. By failing to understand that the space between war and peace is not an empty one, but a landscape churning with political, economic, and security competitions that require constant attention, American foreign policy risks being reduced to a re reactive and tactical emphasis on the military instrument by default. I would add to that, and that's an end quote there, I would add to that, and rush to a futile return to the effect, ineffective militarized war on terror after a major terrorist attack, perhaps this time using weaponized biological or chemical agents. Uh, I'll stop there and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for highlighting the different various thresholds below war and that the war with ISIS and Al-Qaeda still is maybe uh, still simmering, but it's still there as they rebuild. Um, we will now move to questions and answers. So if you have a question, we ask you to raise your hand, identify yourself, and uh, yes, over here. Can you wait for the mic? Um, you mentioned that uh, Many people thought that ISIS was just local uh, until it exploded in, in 2015. But ISIS was created, or ISI, back in 2006. What led them to go global with terrorism? What, what made Emni launch these cells out suddenly? Was it Obama's attack in Sinjar you know, in 2014? What, what, did we cause it? Or what, were those cells out there planning these attacks in Brussels or Paris in advance? The chicken or the egg, which came first? Well, I mean, this is, this is my assumption more than, more than anything else, but I mean, in my view, ISIS's ideology is absolutely no different from Al-Qaeda's. And it's one that sees Islam under constant threat, that sees the defense of Muslim lands as an imperative, and that an aggressive campaign needs to be waged against those enemies of Islam. I would argue it's in ISIS's DNA. In fact, I mean, Baghdadi and others have always said that they are the true heirs to bin Laden, and that Zawahiri and his cronies are actually the deviants. So in that sense, I think it was applying you know, the clear, embattled, uh, ideology and mentality of Al-Qaeda to the group, and then from the very start, they understood that perhaps in order to, I mean, fortunately, you know, terrorist groups do things that often aren't in their own interests. I mean, they think that they're masters, of, I mean, they're, they're control freaks, but often they, they don't understand their enemies, and they understand their enemies far less. And I would say in this context, that they believed as Al-Qaeda had that it was important to preserve whatever local gains they had by waging a much more aggressive offensive campaign against all those that might come to threaten them in the future and to completely neutralize both their influence and intervention in these regions, but also undermine their, I mean, it's almost like the September 11th mentality that you deal a knockout blow so that your enemies will never want to intervene again. And I think that was part of the desire to bring the campaign to Europe as well, of course. You know, much like uh, Al-Qaeda's campaign in, in, on September 11th, 2001 backfired and precipitated the war on terrorism in a way that bin Laden hadn't really calculated. I think it was very much the same, the, the same thing with ISIS. And also, I think, fundamentally, too, um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi believe, as many terrorist or leaders and organizations do, believe their own rhetoric. Uh, 
and believe their own dreams and daydreams. And I think that was that was a key element. But it's it's a great question, Brian, because it underscores that you know these aren't local phenomena; that they see themselves in this constant state of war, and that you engage in external operations or against the far enemy when it suits your agenda and when you think that you can benefit from it, and otherwise you don't, but it's not an either-or choice. Yeah. Glenn, could I just, uh, I'd like to, like to, 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 to basically uh, add to that by, by saying that their, their ideologies are exactly the same. Um, they had a different strategy, and, and one was just on, on steroids, uh, which was with ISIS. Uh, but I think I think part of the part of the problem now is that uh, having having failed um, uh, in their overt uh, acceleration, I think ISIS uh, and Al Qaeda will simply be um, indistinguishable uh, until they show their faces again. In fact, it might it might come from somebody else calling by another name with the same ideology. And what I'm afraid of is is that that we take for granted that. You know, we defeated ISIS uh, pr primarily by breaking their back in the Levant, um, and, and Al Qaeda is kind of lying low, and that we can move on, and and that allows them in the, in this in this at this time to to reactivate this ideology. I mean, they use the same manuals, they use the same strategists, they use the same uh, even tactics. Uh, so I think we shouldn't we shouldn't really see them separately, except they they do have a separate. Uh, identity that we have to have to acknowledge. Let's uh, go right here, and then we'll come to you. Let's uh, go to this side of the room. Uh, there's a microphone coming behind you. Hello. Um, I have a question from Bruce, actually, um, regarding the ideology behind ISIS. Have you heard anything about the theory that ISIS was in pursuit of a doomsday, coming of the end of the world, um, religious folklore where the Mandi um, character is fighting Jesus in a specific town, I don't remember, was Iraq or Syria? And that's why they were, I, the whole building of the caliphate and that kind of play after play, they were trying to create this uh, scenario that has kind of surfaced. Well, I'll say absolutely, and, and, and add a sentence or two, but Michael Ryan is really the, the, the preeminent expert on Al-Qaeda and ISIS ideology. But this, I mean, the specifics of what you're, what you're describing, I'm not aware of, but the point is that both Al-Qaeda and ISIS do embrace a very apocalyptic uh, interpretation of some end of time struggle. This is why ISIS named it on, its online magazine, Dabiq, because that's supposedly the crucible where this, this final, um, you know, battle between the forces of light against those of evil will crystallize, and why Syria is so enormously important, both to ISIS and to Al Qaeda. Uh, but I think maybe Michael studied this much more deeply than I. Well, no, I mean, I, I think that 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 the, the apocalypse is in is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but but in, in all uh, in in and there's and there's various folk you know legends about it. But basically, what you have to see it is forget about the fact that's all the world is coming to an end. They're actually moving to to set up a new era. It's the end of the old and the, and the new. And yes, the the, the last day will come, uh, but we don't know when. And it's a, it's a, it's a Christian ideology too. I mean, in, in some in some sects, where you you have the end uh, end of an epic, the end of the world comes for the new world to begin. And the, and the righteous world before the end. And then, then for both, both Islam and, and Christianity, Jesus comes again at the last day, but nobody says when. Uh, regarding the question of ISIS and the apocalypse, uh, apocalyptic thinking is, is rather common among Muslims worldwide. Uh, I did an article on this for the Middle East Institute a while back, and yes, it did have an influence on their thinking and also on their strategy. They took the insignificant village of Dabak in Syria because there is some kind of prophecy that this would herald the coming of the end times when Jesus would come back and Islam would rule the world. Uh, they also named their magazine after it, which they then changed the magazine's name when they, just, when they lost Dabak. Uh, but to my 
question. As I understand it, especially for Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Ryan, what you're talking about is that we are currently in a situation of a strategic stalemate with basically the jihadis. Uh, do you see anything we can do that would break that stalemate? Well, I don't actually think we're as much of a stalemate as I think we're losing, frankly. I mean, they see this as fundamentally as a war of attrition, not as a war of military victory. I mean, Bin Laden in his last publicly released videotape statement from October 2004 said that he knew that Al-Qaeda and his fighters could never defeat us on the battlefield. He said he was going to bleed us to death. He was going to bankrupt us and undermine our morale. And I think it's not a stalemate in the sense that my former colleague from RAND, Seth Jones, who's now at CSIS, had a report, uh, I guess just last month, where he said there's now something, at least according to his research, nearly a quarter of a million Salafi jihadi fighters throughout the world, four, four times the number that was present on 2001. So obviously, our kinetics and military operations have been enormously successful tactically in holding back the threat, but as I said in my talk, actually achieving some decisive advances eluded us. I mean, I think, to me, it's obvious, and I'd be interested in what Michael has to say about this, but you can only, I mean, these groups are fueled by an ideology, an ideology that they embrace and that they have adhered to and that ISIS has adopted, you know, a cut of whole cloth from, from Al-Qaeda. You could only counter an ideology on ideological terms, yet we have been overwhelmingly for the past 17 years and not entirely successfully relying on genetic um, operations. I have nothing against kinetic operations. I think you absolutely have to break the back of these organizations. But what we find is that they, they carry within them, within their own DNA, the seeds to constantly regenerate and to continue to attract recruits and to continue to attra attract support, which locks us into a never-ending war. And I don't think anyone imagined on the, e on the, in the immediate aftermath, rather, of September 11, 2001, that 17 years we'd still be fighting it. So. When you think that the United Kingdom, for instance, spends about 1% of its counterterrorism budget on countering ideology, I don't think that's at all an isolated phenomena. It's something that's less amenable to metrics. I mean, when you're killing and capturing terrorist leaders, it's very clear this, what you're achieving. But I would argue that this remains one of the neglected aspects of this struggle and has never been effectively married to and become and prosecuted in tandem with uh, kinetics. <coughs> Uh, I, I mean, I don't. Th I don't think we're at stalemate at all. Um, I, I think. I think. I, I, I think. I don't look at it in those terms. Um, they are achieving uh, certain goals, but they, they're they're working in a different timeline. And 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 I think they see um, simply the need to retool. Um, I find it interesting in, in the, the long speech, which I listened to, it's, just, it's, an, it's an hour long, so I had, I had to listen to it over and over, um, that Baghdadi did when he came out of hiding. Um, he, t he talks a, a lot about um, uh, everything that, that you can think about in terms of ideology and, and the need for, uh, for belief and, and, uh, uh, and how, uh, how uh, and, and he does it by quoting, uh, selectively quoting from the, the Quran in this, this beautiful way that he actually has to do it. And basically he's, he's saying that, you know, God, God um, uh, makes us fail so that to keep us from being too proud and, 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 uh, and it's, an, it's a lesson to, you know, to, to, to only achieve greater things, to move on to the next thing. So I think that I think that uh, I've also I, I, I spent just struggling with with the problem that we that, that Bruce mentioned we've never challenged with, which is, is the ideology. Logic doesn't work. It's not an argument. It's not you know it, it's it's when ISIS and Al Qaeda do their recruiting, they don't start with ideology. You know if, if they if they follow the procedures in their manuals, which they do sometimes, uh, they only get to the ideology at the end. And by that time, they have somebody who's, who is, is bound to them by, uh, by other bonds, of, of, uh, and, and they've radicalized them in, in another way. And it's exactly the same way as any cult or any, any, uh, any movement uh, works. And you can't argue, you can't argue against it. Uh, you, you can try to prevent it, 
and that's something that we haven't even touched. Uh, uh, and and loneliness. I found it interesting. Um, loneliness as a as a theme in Al Baghdadi. I didn't expect this. Um, that some of you may be feeling lonely, but we're, we're, you, we're your brothers, and we're going to join you again. And then those of you in prisons, you know, we're coming to get you. You know, don't worry. Um, loneliness is one of the things that that, and just the kind of loss of way in life that is uh, makes the individuals subject to radicalization. And once uh, you know, there's a process that goes two or three, four or five steps. Once they get past the first or second step, you are not going to convince that individual that's not, not the righteous thing to follow their path. They can make the decision themselves, um, uh, or, 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 they, or they, can, they can give up for the time being. Uh, most of the people that have gone through programs uh, for de-radicalization in the Middle East didn't actually uh, give up their ideology. They, they found they couldn't, they gave up the violence for the time being. Uh, and, until their operations uh, came. I mean, Saudi Arabia had just, you couldn't have a better designed uh, program for de-radicalizing people. And it worked until, I mean, they, they got them families, they, they, they got them jobs, they gave them money, they gave them everything. Uh, but if they were already radicalized and they had the ideology, the first time you got a, a, a whistle from somebody across the, uh, across the border in Yemen, uh, to come join us again, they took the, they took it, and they did it. Uh, and, and I think I think it's just uh, something that we need to do a lot of work on, uh, and uh, we haven't even scratched the surface. And 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 we, by the way, I, I would apply that to the United States as well, uh, because the, the the method that somebody becomes a neo-Nazi is exactly the way that he becomes a jihadist, uh, or she becomes a jihadist. Uh, and and it's not starting with the ideology; it's starting with being lost in life being lonely and suddenly you have more friends and you knew how to deal with and that's what they do it's not a very cheering thought we're about over we're over our time and what I'll do is I'll bundle the questions uh, take a question here and then here and then we've got to break I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more about other arguably more mainstream uh, you know forms of uh, you know political Islam you know, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Hamas, uh, even the NADA, where do those organizations fit in uh, to, you know, is it a continuum? Are these fundamentally different types of organizations? Um, thanks. And the question here? And who is your question directed to? Anybody? Okay. Oh, sorry, because my question is completely different. It was um, with population shifts in developing countries moving from rural to urban, how will the Nej uh, Najee and al-Suri uh, dichotomy of, of war fighting that, the, that, have, that has informed these groups over the last few years, how will that shift and evolve as we see more operations in urban theaters? Anybody? I mean, I, I think I think we've seen it already. I mean, we, we, we saw it uh, we saw it in Syria. I mean, Syria, as you I'm sure know, um, had a terrible drought and their and, and their crops failed. Uh, uh, they, um, uh, they they basically had people who couldn't anymore work in the fields. Uh, these these were rural people. Uh, they were uh, uh, more conservative than, than, than their, their brothers. They went to the, the cities and joined, and, and joined up to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the jihad, really. Um, and uh, I, I just as, as, a, as, a, as a slight uh, take on what I was saying before, and, and, and one, of the, one of the prioritizations of, of uh, people that, that, uh, that um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS look for to try to uh, radicalize or recruit First they radicalize, then they recruit. Uh, is they 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 want they want people who are not very religious, but kind of religious. Vaguely, they could be Muslim or Christian, uh, presumably educated, not criminals, um, and often in in rural areas. So that the ideal person for them is someone who is in a rural area, has been educated, is is not a criminal. Um, is vaguely religious, 
and open to to uh, and and lonely in need of new friends, which they're going to get. And I think when when people go to the cities, depending on on which vice in a city gets you, um, you know, a, a number of those people are going to be vulnerable, and we'll see and we'll see more problems. But I think that's already. I think it's happened. It's it's going to happen again, and it's going to continue because I don't think our weather is going to get better. Anybody want to answer his question? Well, oh, 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 Hamas and and the yeah. Muhammad uh, and, and, the, and the Muslim Brotherhood. I thought, you know, in a way, that that is a question directed to all day, you know, because you're going to have people that are going to be going to be talking about this. I mean, uh, basically, I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood is is a is a, a, a jihadist opera, operation uh, that uh, works has worked permanently in the gray zone, and 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 you're going to have a foremost world ep expert this afternoon talk about about that, and, and, you, and, and you should raise that with her. Uh, Hamas is, is seen, has, has been seen by, uh, by Al-Qaeda as being a, a nationalistic uh, 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 group primarily, and therefore not, you know, not in their, in their, uh, in their, uh, brother. That, I mean, the, the thing about the Muslim Brotherhood that I've always seen is the ideology is very, very similar. It's just that it's put off to to a, a, a longer time frame, and and the root there is a, is a different strategy, uh, but the ideology, the endpoint's the same. Uh, that's my opinion. But. Okay, we're gonna have to break uh, for the uh, coffee break now, and we want to adjourn for about 20 minutes. So our next speaker will be here shortly. So thank, give everyone a round of applause. Thank you for the great insights today.